All right, now in Exodus chapter 16 here, we have this story, and it's all about manna. That's what the sermon's going to be preached about this morning. I've preached and teach all about, about this manna and, and kind of what it means. And we're going to be going later to John chapter um, 6, I believe it is, where Jesus explains that he is the bread from heaven. And, um, but here we're going to start in Exodus 16. This is where it's basically first brought up because you have the children of Israel. They just were delivered out of Egypt. They just came out of Egypt. God, with a strong hand and a mighty arm, sent all the plagues. They parted the Red Sea. They crossed. They, you know, the sea came back and, and killed Pharaoh's armies that were chasing after him. They witnessed all these miracles, right? And now they're in the wilderness. And God's going to lead them to the promised land. That was, that's what God had promised them. He promised to bring them into another land, into an area that's you know flowing with milk and honey, a good land, something that... that you know, he's, he's bringing them into a new, an inheritance that's going to be theirs forever. And I say this every time I preach on the children of Israel at this time point, it amazes me how much they don't, they lack their faith in God after seeing so much of what he's done for them. And I think that could go to, to, to show a little bit that, um, you need to have faith in God no matter what. We don't always get to see things. Now, these people got to see all of those miracles, all those plagues. They got to see the Red Sea be imparted, and that still, for many of them, wasn't enough. You can't rely on having to see things and witness things. A lot of these people, they still didn't have that great of a faith in God or any faith at all. And, and that's where we start off here in chapter 16, and they're murmuring, right? They're complaining. They're saying, Oh, man, why did you bring us out of Egypt now just to die with hunger because we don't have any food in this wilderness? You know, God performed all of these miracles, and now they're still just going to complain about the situation they're in. He freed them from their bondage, from their slavery. Saw a great, I mean, God was able to, to wipe out the entire army of Pharaoh's army. The entire army of Egypt just got, got annihilated, and they witnessed this. And now they're just going to complain and say, oh, I would, you know, it would be better if we just would have died back in Egypt instead of killing us with hunger in the wilderness. Instead of having the proper attitude and just going to God and, with, with, you know, and asking for instead of complaining. And no matter what, and this is what this is about, but no matter what situation you're in, don't complain about it. Because God has you in that situation for a reason. Now, you might have brought it upon yourself, or you may not have. But regardless... Don't be murmuring and complaining about the things that God has given you in your life. It's the wrong focus to be thinking about the things that you don't have. You need to be thinking about the things that you do have and what God has provided for you instead of getting a, 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 a bad attitude and a bad heart against God, especially when God's the one who gives you all the good gifts in the first place. So, so try to keep that in mind. Don't be like these the rebellious people here that got let out of Egypt and just had this, this poor attitude um, and they were going through hard times. I mean, they were hungry, right? I mean, suffering hunger isn't a pleasant thing. And most of us today have a hard time probably even understanding what it's like to go through that kind of hunger or going days without eating. We are extremely blessed in this society today and in this culture that, I mean, most of us have a lot. I mean, I know we do. We, we, you get a little bit hungry and you're able to just satisfy yourself with, with eating something. It's real convenient. You've got it stocked up. You can go to the store or whatever. You know, these people didn't have that. They really were just, just out of nowhere. They didn't have any food. They didn't just say, oh, I'm feeling kind of hungry. I'm going to eat something. So, you know, <laughs> before you're real quick to judge them, right, think about, put yourself in the situation that they're in. They're walking and hiking through the wilderness and they've got nothing to eat. Now, they should not have been murmuring against God. Again, it's easier, it's easier to say it, but just kind of think about it. Because when you think about the situation they're in, maybe you can relate that to any situations that you're in. You could be feeling physically. I mean, when you're hungry, when you go days without eating, you, you start to feel, I mean, it, it hits you. And you start getting really hungry, and that's what you start focusing on. Because your body is telling you, hey, I need to eat. And, and, you, and you get those types of feelings, those types of cravings. But we can't lose sight of the fact, look, when, when you have a need, especially a great need, like you're going through pain, you're going through suffering, go to God with your troubles. He is able to, to, to see you through. He's able to, to, to protect you. And this is what he did here in Exodus 16. He provides food for them. He's like, I've heard your murmurings. I've heard what you're saying. He's like, look, 
I'm going to make sure that you understand that I am able to, to take care of you. And he, and he sends them this manna. And look at verse, uh, verse 14. It gives, a, it gives a little explanation of what manna is. In verse 14 of Exodus 16, it says, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. Hoar just means white, excuse me. So when you, when you wake up early in the morning in the winter and you see frost on the ground, basically you're saying that the manna was, was this small round thing that was, that, was, that was on the ground that was as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So you see the frost on the ground, it was just, it was just a little bit, and it, but it covered the whole ground. And verse 15 says, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. They didn't know what it was, so they just made up a name for it, and they called it manna. And it says, And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And I want to just point out that it says, This is the bread that he's given to you, because... Throughout the Bible and in different uh, places we're going to look for, look through in the Bible, manna can be synonymous with bread because he's referring to his bread. Now, it doesn't mean that it was exactly bread, like, you know, baking a bread. That's not what it means, but it was their meat, it was their food, and the Bible's referring to it as bread. And um, it says in verse 16, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, gather of every man according to his eating. And Omer for every man, according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an Omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to So he said, you know, okay, go out and gather. They had to go out every morning and gather the man off the ground. I mean, they had to go collect it. They had to go scrape it off of the ground, off of the leaves, off of the grass, wherever, wherever it was collected. They had to go get it. And he tells them how much to get. And he said, so, you know, but according to their eating, however much you think you're going to eat, go, go gather of it. And it says, you know, some people gathered a lot, some people gathered a little, but everybody was completely satisfied. So those that gathered a lot, they didn't have any excess. They didn't have any extra. They had exactly what was needed for them. And those that gathered a little, they didn't lack anything. They didn't, they didn't need anything more than what they were given. God has laid out and, and given the sustenance to everybody to satisfy every single one of them individually, uniquely, you know, whether they needed a lot or whether they needed a little, whatever their needs were, God met those needs completely and nobody had any extra, nobody had any lack. They were all completely satisfied with exactly what they needed. And it's interesting here too, because then you see the people, you know, Moses commands them, he says, okay, look. You need to go out and, and gather this manna, but don't, don't save up any of it for the next day. He's like, don't save it, don't store it. And the point being that they needed to rely on God every single day. This isn't something they're going to go and hoard up and save up and store it up for later. He says, no. He said, don't do it. But what they do, a lot of some people did it anyways. They did it anyways, and then what happened? Well, it got old, and instead of bread worms, and it stank. So it just got really old and nasty real fast, like just, just overnight, the, this manna just turned bad, it turned rotten, it bred worms immediately. And then he tells them on the Sabbath day, he said on, on the day before the Sabbath, go out and collect extra. That's the day that you go out and get extra, don't, you know, because you're not supposed to go out and gather of it on the Sabbath day. He said, you're not going to go out, we, you know, don't collect anything, the Sabbath is a day of rest. You need to obey God's commandments. God knows that the Sabbath is a day of rest, and he knows that you have need, and he knows that you need to be fed, so he's going to take care of you extra the day before, and just the day before, not two days before, not three days before, not four days before, not earlier in the week. No, the one day, the day before the Sabbath is the day you're supposed to go out, and then you get extra, then you do your baking, however you're going to, you know, you're going to boil it in water, however you're going to prepare that manna for yourself. He says, do all of that in the day before the Sabbath, and then on the Sabbath, you'll have enough to eat in the morning. And then, of course, people went out on the Sabbath and, and, and against what Moses had commanded, against what God had commanded, and they didn't find any man on the ground. And this is just proving how supernatural this is. I mean, you think about it. There's this, this man is on the ground six days out of the week. But then just that one day, just the Sabbath of rest is the only day it's not on the ground. The only day. There's no, uh, no possible natural explanation to say, oh yeah, well, every other day it's going to show up and then on the Sabbath it's not. 
And likewise, there's no possible explanation you can say to have it breed worms and stink with just holding it over one day, any other day of the week, except for the day before it wasn't going to be there. Because that was the only time it worked where you can save it up for the next day was just on the day before the Sabbath day. And, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool because there is no other way to, to explain it. And then God did that on purpose, I believe, so that they just know without a doubt, hey, I am providing this for you. You don't have any reason to complain. You don't have any reason to worry. Have faith in me. I'm going to take care of you. I am providing for you. Look, he may not, he didn't build them palaces out in the wilderness and give them, you know, steak and all this other. He didn't, la you know, give them all this lavishness, but he provided for their needs. He gave them what was needful. He gave them what they needed to survive and what they get through. And it wasn't even that bad. Look at verse uh, 31. I actually think this sounds pretty good. It explains a little bit more about what the manna is. In, in verse 31, it says, And the house of Israel called the name of manna, and it was like coriander seed. That's just kind of a small seed. White, so it was white in color, just like frost is white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. I mean, wafers made with honey sounds pretty good to me. I don't know about you, but it's, you know, it's sweet. Sounds like it's good to the taste. God's given him something that was, um, that was good and, and healthy for him. And he provided for them completely. Verse 32 says, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, fill an omer of it, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. So here's another supernatural occurrence. He commanded them to keep some of the manna and to put it in a pot. And it was to be kept for generations to come. Now, the manna that they ate, if they saved it up to the next day, they're going to breed worms and stink. But here, they, they kept this up for generations to come to just show them, say, hey, look, this is what God fed us in the wilderness. So that when they came out of the wilderness and they finally inherited the promised land, they would still be able to show their descendants and their generations, God fed us with this manna and they saved it. And that did not breed worms. That did not stink. God preserved that manna for the generations to come. And this is amazing. Too. And, and, and there's so much symbolism of manna. We're going to get into this as we go, but I can't pass this one up for the fact that he, he tell, told them to, to continue on because manna has a couple of different symbolic references. And one of them is that it's um, basically is symbolic of God's word. Okay. The Bible says, I was going to get there in just a few minutes, but I'll get there right now. In Deuteronomy 8, Verse uh, 3, the Bible says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. So he's saying the reason why, he said he humbled you, you know, you, you, had, you had to be humbled, you had to be brought low, and suffered you to hunger, he allowed you to become hungry. And then he fed you with that manna. And the reason why he fed them with that manna says, so that you can know that man doth not live by bread alone. Like, you shouldn't be so focused on, on having bread and that that's your goal and just, and just be so focused on the physical, the physical needs and the physical flesh, but that you need to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that was quoted by Jesus Christ also in the New, in the, in the New Testament when he was tempted by Satan. And Matthew 4, 4 says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That was Jesus Christ quoting Deuteronomy 8, 3. Every word of God is important. And that's what he was, he was saying. He used the manna to teach them that. And just like they preserved that manna for generations to come, God preserved it, not them. God told them, put this in the pot and save it up. God preserved that manna to be able to show the children for generations to come. God fed us with this manna. The same way God has preserved his word. Now, if we need to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, then we need every word of God. He's not going to command us to do something we can't do. God has preserved his word for us today completely in the English language. It's in the King James Bible. We have that today. We have every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God preserved for us today. The same way God preserved his manna in that pot, 
God preserved his word for us today. It's not man that does the preservation. Now, man has some workings in it, and, and God's using man to, to, to do the translations and to do these other things and, and, to, and to keep it going. But ultimately, God is the one that's making sure that his word is, is in its true form the way it ought to be for all generations. I don't believe that God has kept back his word or has kept it hidden under a rock anywhere, but that he's allowed us to, to have his word for all generations. And, um, and that's one of the symbolic references that we see here with, um, with this manna. Now, as a side note, I'm going to just hit this real quick because it's in my notes. It doesn't quite fit in very much, but just, to, just uh, I'm trying to cover up most or if not all the verses that, that pertain to manna. The Bible says in Psalm 78, um, verse 24, it says, and, and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. So it calls manna also the corn of heaven. And man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. So the Bible also calls manna angels' food. God, God gave them this, this heavenly food, this um, corn of heaven to, to provide for them. And he, said, and he said that's even angels' food. That's what the angels eat. So it was this amazing miracle they provided for them. And um, it says in Numbers 11, you don't have to turn there. If you would, just turn to, um, turn to Revelation chapter number 10. But in, um, in Numbers 11, it says, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was as the color of bdellium. And um, when I was studying and preparing for the sermon, I looked up bdellium, like what is that? And there's people saying different things, and they have these different pictures up. But it's interesting, because Bedellium's only, only mentioned twice in the Bible, only two times. And, um, and here it's in reference to manna, and it's saying the color there, excuse me, the color there was the color of manna, or of, the color of Bedellium. But we already saw earlier, in Exodus 16, it says that it was like coriander seed white. So we already know that the color is white. So we know that the color of Bedelia must be white because it already mentioned that the color was white. And as it, a lot, most of the things that I found, and this is something too to warn you when you look up stuff on the internet without really using the Bible as your source. You know, when I just looked up Bedelia on the internet, the images that came up, it was all brown. It was all this brown, it's like this sap and this other stuff. And that's what they were saying Bedelia is. But there's, there were other people that were saying different things. You know, there's, there's other information out there. But it doesn't matter. The truth is the Bible said that it was white. So bedellium must be white if it's the color of bedellium. Um, not that big of a deal, but I just kind of wanted to, to throw that out there that, you know, when you're, when you're researching and studying the Bible, make sure you're studying the Bible and not just reading and, and believing everything that you hear off the Internet or everything that you read that someone just wrote. Or people are saying, oh, yeah, this is what bedellium looks like. Well, the Bible says something different. So really try to make sure that you're... You're getting all, as much source as possible as you can from the Bible, and it's what the Bible says, and look up everywhere you can, because this is something that, if you were just looking up Bedellium, you wouldn't even necessarily make the reference with the manna, but, um, but it's, it's there, and you, can, and you can get that, you can glean that information out of it. But anyways, I don't want to spend any more time on that. That was just a little side note. Um, <clears throat> now... Going back to, to, the, to the, what we already saw, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. This is an extremely profound verse. There's so much truth packed into just that one short verse. Because you think about it, we, need, we know that we need physical bread to survive, right? Because he said, man shall not live by bread alone. You need bread, but that's not all you need. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we have bellies. We need to fill it with food. I mean, in order to continue to survive, you can only go so long without eating before you're, you're going to perish, before your body's going to die. Obvious. That's obvious, right? But just as important as it is to eat the physical food in order to continue to survive, in order to grow, we must live by every word of God. And we need to be treating the Bible, we need to be treating God's word as important as the daily food that you eat. I mean, you, there's, you would think about it like, would you ever say, oh, you know what, I'm just not going to eat this week. I just, I just don't feel like it. I don't think I'm going to eat. You know, I, it's not, uh, I, don't have, I don't have time for it. How about that? I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have time to eat. So I'm just not going to eat this week. I'm real busy. But do you say that about reading the Bible? Say, oh, 
Uh, you know, I don't really have time to read my Bible. I've been, I was real busy. I was working all day today. You know, I ate. I did all this other stuff. And now I'm really tired. And now I'm going to go to bed and I haven't read my Bible. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that way about food, would you? But the Bible says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's word is important. It's critical. It's critical in your life. You need to be getting this manna. You need to be getting this word daily. God provided his manna for them to gather daily. And, and one other thing about the manna is when the sun came, when the sun heated up, it melted it. So they had to get up early and they had to gather that manna early. They couldn't wait till the end of the day to do it. And I think that we should treat our Bible reading the same way. You should start your day off. I mean, even if it's just a little bit, start your day with the Bible, with God's Word. Start your day off right. Get a little bit of His Word. Get that manna. Get that started. But start your day off. Because, you know what? You might get really busy for the rest of your day. You might have all this other stuff. Make sure you get the sustenance that you need. Make sure you get that, that meat from God's Word. That you get that first. That you put God first, you give his, give his word a priority and say, this is more important than my bread. This is more important than my work. This is more important than anything else. Hearing from God and hearing what he has for me, I'm going to make sure that I put him first. I'm going to give him the priority in my life. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to read, even if it's just a little bit, I'm going to read the Bible. And then I'm going to do everything else. That way you don't have the excuse of saying, oh, well, I'm tired, I'm busy, I don't have the time, I can't do this, I can't do that. No, when you make the time and you say, you know what, the first thing I do, and if you don't have time from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, then set your alarm 10 minutes early, 20 minutes early, and get your Bible reading in and make the time. But I don't believe that. I don't believe there's anybody here that says, uh, from, the top, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I have zero time to read the Bible. That's just ridiculous. I'm going to call you a liar if, that's, if you think that that's the case. I don't believe that. We all have time. Now, I am not going to dictate what time you have or anything like that and the priorities you set, but we all have time for God's Word. He would not tell us to do something if we couldn't do it. We're all capable of doing it, um, and we need to treat it with that much importance. You know, some people live their lives just to feed their belly. That's what their goal is. Their, their goal is just... I want more things. I want more stuff. I want to accumulate riches on this earth. I want to, you know, do whatever. I want to be able to, to, to eat out every day. I want to be able to go out and get these fancy steaks and get all this other stuff. And that's what they're living for. And that's what their goal is. And that's what their focus is. Their goal is just to satisfy themselves and their lusts. And this focus can creep in anyone's life. I, I'm not just talking about, oh, this is just the heathen. I mean, Christians can have this type of attitude. Anybody can have this start to creep in where your focus starts to get drawn away. You start thinking about, about the money and the, and the things and the, and the food and whatever it, whatever it is. Whatever it is, that, that, that bread for you, that lust for you that comes up. Don't get caught up in those physical necessities of this world. It, it could can, it can, it can distract you. It could drive you away. But if you're, if you're reading the Bible first thing in the morning, that will help prevent that. When you're getting God's word in first, before you do any other stuff. See, it's easy. The more you get away from God's word and the more you're busy with other things, it's easy to, to have that snowball and to continue to stay busy with those things and continue to stay focused on those things. The more of your time they're eating up, the more, the more you're just, you have your attention drawn to them, the easier it's going to be to continue in that cycle. But if you made it a point and say, no, I'm just going to go and I'm going to get God's manna first. I'm going to do it before the sun gets hot so it doesn't just vanish away and I don't have the time anymore, I'm going to read it first thing. That'll help prevent that type of an attitude. That'll help you keep your mind right, keep your heart right with God, and to keep you focused. So as you're going through the rest of your day, you know, try not to be forgetful of the things that you read in the morning and how you started off your day um, because it's important. I mean, that, that was Jesus Christ's answer to the devil. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need every word of God. Now, um, in Re you're in Revelation 10. I had you turn there. The reason why I had you turn there is because we saw earlier that, um, that manna, it said it was like a wafer. Um, it, it was made like wafers made with honey, right? And when I was preparing for the sermon, I saw that, you know, manna is, is this honey tasting, sweet tasting food they prepared. Well, in Revelation 10, look at verse number 9. I, I thought of this verse. It says, 
And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So here he's, John gets his book, right? And the book is full of words that he's going to need to preach, and we're going to see that in verse 11. He gives him this book. He needs to eat it up so that he can go and then, and then preach these words. But it says that it's going to be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So he eats it, and, and it's that, that correlation with the manna. The manna was sweet. The manna tasted like honey. Well, he gives them his word, and his word says it should be in my mouth sweet as honey. And then verse 10 says, And I took a little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So when we get the manna, when you receive that manna, when you receive God's word, when you eat it up, when you read it, right, when it goes into your body, when it goes into your mind, it's not good enough just to retain it in your mind. He wants you to go out and then preach it. And, and this is something that everyone can do. Again, it's not just for the man behind the pulpit in church to be the one that preaches. We all have a preaching aspect in our life. Everybody should be a soul. Everyone should be preaching at least the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that are lost. Everybody. That's everybody's responsibility to do that. And you can prophesy. The, 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 prophesy is just another word for preaching, okay, in the Bible. Preach the word and don't let this word just go into you and just stay there. Let it come out too. I mean, that what you, what, what, what you hear in, the, in secret and in the closet, he said that proclaim upon the housetops. Don't just let it go in and be silent. You know, God's given you to be a light, a light unto the world. Let your light shine. The things that come in, the things that God teaches you, don't just keep them for yourselves. I mean, it's just like your salvation. If you were to keep your salvation to yourself, okay, great. Well, what does that do for everybody else? God teaches you some wisdom from the Bible. Hey, that's good wisdom. That's good to know. It's going to help you. But why don't you use that wisdom and, and teach others and help other people out the same way? Um, you know, the Christian life in general is not one of, of, uh, of being seclusive and reclusive and just, and just I'm saved and I'm on my own and I'm going to live righteously and I'm just going to just be off by myself in, in some remote part of the world somewhere away from everybody else. That's not what God has called us to do. Everything that you receive from God, you ought to be in turn giving. The Bible says freely you have received, freely give. So all the stuff that God's given you, hey, don't just hoard it and keep it for yourself. Tell other people about it. Deuteronomy 8, verse 16 says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. So again, we're seeing in Deuteronomy 8 here now, I, I kind of shifted gears from Revelation. Deuteronomy 8, it's saying, you know, God fed the children of Israel with manna to humble them. Now, I, brief, I, I covered this briefly just a little while ago. And the humility... That, that you need is, is to have that total reliance on God to feed you. See, if you're going to be relying on God, you need to be humble. The opposite of that would be proud, right? Where you're thinking, I can do everything myself. Well, God didn't want his people to be proud. So that's why he led them into the wilderness. That's why he wanted them completely trusting in him. And in order to completely trust in God, you have to humble yourself. I mean, that's why for salvation, what's keeping many people back from getting saved is that they have a pride that makes them want to think that I'm getting to heaven because I'm a good person, because I've done this or that good work, and I'm good enough to make it. And they want to have that attitude, that proud attitude that says, I can do it on my own. I don't need your help. I don't need to rely on you, God, but God says, no, in order for you to be saved, you have to completely rely on Jesus Christ that he saved you. You have to completely rely on him. It is not your own flesh. It's not your own good works. It's nothing that you do. It's the blood that he shed for you. You have to completely rely on God the same way that my children completely rely on me to pay the bills and to feed them food and to give them clothing. They have to rely on me to do that. They can't do it on their own. That's the same reliance we have to have on God. That's why we have to humble ourselves as little children, humble themselves. I mean, they're humble. They have to rely on us. They have no other ways of doing it. We have no other way of getting to heaven. We have to completely rely on God, but not just getting to heaven, not just salvation. We ought to be relying on God for everything in our life. We ought to be relying on him to feed us. We ought to be relying on him to take care of us, to protect us, to keep us in the right path and doing what we're supposed to be doing. 
we need to be humble and just recognize, okay, look, God, I'm going to try my best, but I am completely relying on you to guide my path, to provide the food for me. Look, God, if you, if you have that right attitude, you're going to say, God, I'm going to do what I know that you've told me to do. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to witness the people, to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And look, it takes some time. Now, if that time takes away from your job, if that takes away some from your work, from your income, from things like that, look, what he's, what he's trying to point out is say, look, rely on me. I know you have these needs. I know they have to be met. I can take care of them. Just do what I want you to do. Now, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job in order to prove your faith to God. God wants you to provide for your family if you're a man. He wants you to, to be able to do that and, and, to, and to support your family and pay for them. But look, he also says you need to rely on him. And that don't worry about if, 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 if obeying God is going to cost you somewhere or if you think it's going to put you in danger. People say, like, oh, well, well, that's a dangerous neighborhood. You know, people will say to people, family members and stuff will say, you know, get kind of scared. Like, you going into that neighborhood? Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's funny for many reasons because, for one, I mean, I'm not afraid to go into any neighborhood. Okay, and, uh, people are people. Some are more dangerous than others. Now, it doesn't mean that you should just foolishly just, I mean, for absolutely no reason, kind of, you know, put yourself in a situation where you might be in a little bit more harm's way. But, but here's the thing. If you're doing God's work, if you're doing God's will, if you're doing God's work, He is completely able to protect you and, and make sure that nothing's going to happen to you. And if it does happen to you and you're doing God's will, then God allowed that to happen. And there's a reason behind it. So you can't just get upset or think that like, oh, I'm so worried, and, you know, like this is so dangerous. Hey, if you're doing what God has you to do and what God's commanded you to do, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna trust in Him and just trust that God knows. And if He's gonna allow something to happen to me, then there's a reason behind it, and so be it. And then, then God's will will be done. But otherwise, He's gonna protect me. I mean, it's the same way with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Book of Daniel, when they stood up and said, "We're not gonna bow down." Right? We're not going to bow down to the graven image. God told us not to worship, not to fall down, not to worship any graven images. We know that we're in God's will. We're not going to do it. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you have the death penalty on it. I don't care if you're going to throw us into that burning, fiery furnace. God told us not to do it. And we know that God is capable of protecting us. See, they had full assurance and faith in God. And they said, look, if he doesn't, you know, well, whatever, that's we're still not going to bow down. We're not going to break God's commandments. Because God could have allowed them to be martyred. He could have. But there would have been a reason behind that. Maybe they would have had an impact on someone else. We don't know. I mean, God's had his people martyred. I mean, Stephen got martyred, right? We don't always know God's plan, but we'll, if we're in God's will, then we're in, the, we're in the right place. Whatever the consequences may be for them, we need to have that full that humble reliance on Him, where we just say, you know what, I'm completely trusting in what you have for me to do. It doesn't matter what man says. It doesn't matter what anyone else is going to say. We're just going to do what you have for us to do. And it says, um, <clears throat> and it also says, besides humbling them, in Deuteronomy 8.16, He says, He fed them with the manna that He might humble them, and they might prove them. Proving means He's testing them. He wants to see where their hearts are at. He wants to be able to see are you really going to trust in me? You know, when I bring you through this, this, these harder times, when I let you hunger a little bit, you know, he's not going to kill him. He's never going to kill him. That wasn't his intent. But he's proving him. He's testing him. Say, okay, now you're going through a little bit of a hard time. Is your heart right with me? Are you going to obey? Are you going to listen to me? But then he says to prove thee, to do the good at the latter end. And oftentimes that's what happens. See, God has a plan in mind for us. God has something where he's going to say, you may be struggling, you may be going through hard times now, but the blessing is going to come at the later end. And you have, to, you have to understand that. Instead of being so focused on everything that's happened right in the moment, you might just be getting tried. You make it through that trial. You make it through that, that, that point of proving and then the blessings will come later. And you, but you have to have the faith in order to know that the blessings will come later. You know, for us, we know for sure that God has blessings for us in heaven. He has rewards. He has rewards that are laid out for us 
if we do that which is right in this lifetime. If we decide to obey him and to, and to win souls and to do all the things that he's laid out for us to do, we know, and if you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 6, because this really does a good job of explaining this, of, of the latter end, getting, getting the blessings and receiving the blessings. And Matthew chapter 6 ties in completely with what he was doing here with the manna. I have to zip through this because I am not getting through the sermon as fast as I need to be. But Matthew chapter 6, look at verse number 19. We're going to read, we're going to read a long section of scripture here. I'm going to preach on a little bit of it. Matthew 6 verse 19. Because we're, we're talking about the manna and why God gave, why God allowed them to hunger, um, allowed them to hunger through the wilderness and then feed them with the manna. And he said that he wanted to prove them that they can do, that he could do, 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 excuse me. Do good to them in his latter end, in their latter end, at the end. Matthew 6, 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is like money. Okay, and that's what we were talking about earlier. Look, we don't want to be focused on the fleshly appetites, on the things that we can accumulate, and the things that we can get in this lifetime. Don't be focused on the men, on the mammon, on the money, because he said you can't serve God and money. You have to make a decision. You have to be able to decide, am I going to focus just on being able to make money and, and doing all these other things, or am I going to focus on serving God and, and, and doing what he wants me to do? You can't do both. He says you're either going to love the one and hate the other, or you're going to hold to the one and despise the other. He says, therefore, so because of this, I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment. He's saying, look, for this reason, because you can't serve God and you can't serve mammon, he said, therefore, take no thought for your life. Don't think about those things. Hey, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What kind of clothing am I going to have? He says, don't worry about that stuff. That's not where your focus should be. He says, isn't the life more than just eating food and putting on clothing? Life is way more important than that. Life is way more precious than that. That's not what it's all about. It's not about how good can you be eating and how great clothing can you put on. He says, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Say, aren't you a lot better than these birds? Hey, God takes care of the birds. God feeds them. He provides a place for them to stay. Aren't you much better than them? He says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So he's talking about the lilies... They grow in the field. They don't do anything. They just grow up. And he's saying that they're way more beautiful. They're clothed way more beautifully than Solomon ever was. And Solomon was like the richest person to ever live in the world. I mean, he got all of the, I mean, all the wealthiest stuff. He had all the wealth. Anything that he wanted, he had the clothing. He had the food. He had all that stuff. And as we were talking about earlier, what did he call it? Vanity. He said, vanity of vanity, said the preacher. All is vanity. It meant nothing. So you're going to be focused on what are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? What am I going to put on? Hey, how, well, how much money can I make? How many things can I collect? Solomon had all that stuff and more. And he said it's all vain. It's vanity. It's worthless. It's meaningless. Don't spend your life trying to, to, to seek after and to search after all this money that's not going to do you any good. It's all going to vanish. It's all going to burn up. Focus on the things that really matter, that have eternal life. You have souls that are going to last eternity, forever. Our life is but a vapor on this earth. The things that you accumulate, the things that you wear, it's so temporal. It's, it, I mean, it lasts a day, it lasts a year, it lasts 10 years, and it's gone. 
God's going to destroy this whole earth. Verse 30 says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, it's gone, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He's saying don't worry about where your food's going to come from, where your clothing's going to come from. Do what God has commanded you to do. If you're a man, go to work, but do these other things that God has commanded you to do. Look, have your mind focused on heavenly things because God knows you have needs. If God, if you're a son of God, if you're a child of God, hey, God's your father. He's going to look out for you. The same way that I look out for my children, or even better than I look out for my children, God's going to look out for you. If you're doing what he tells you to do, if you're doing what's right, he's going to make sure you're fed. He'll make sure you're clothed. He'll make sure that you have the things that you need because he knows you need them. It's not a surprise to God like, oh, what, you mean you need to eat? God made you. He knows you need to eat. He'll take care of that if you just stay focused on the things that he wants you to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's why we start off reading the Bible first thing in the morning. Seek him first. Seek what he wants you to do first. Give him the priority. Hey, all of these things will be added unto you. You don't have to worry about those stuff. Now the manna lasted. God gave them this manna until they came out of the wilderness and passed over Jordan and began to inherit the promised land. This manna was given to them as a, a means of sustaining them until they could make it into the promised land. Now, again, a lot more symbolism there. When they inherited their physical promised land, we know that we're going to enter into God's rest. We need to work. We need to work hard. And, and, then, and then we're going to enter into God's rest. When we finally breathe our last breath, we're going to be entering into the promised land, into our inheritance in heaven, into the mansions that Jesus has made for us, and, and we will be able to rest from the works that we've done here. We're going to enter into God's rest. And, um, and this manna sustained them for just as long as they needed it in that wilderness until they could enter into the promised land. It says in uh, Joshua 5.10, it says, The children of Israel are camped in Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. They did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn on the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel, uh, neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So God stopped. The manna just completely ceased. No more manna. Um, when, they, when they made it into the promised land. Now, the last place we're going to look at, turn, if you would, please, at John chapter number 6. John 6, because this is huge. I cannot preach a sermon without getting to John chapter 6. This is like the major point of the sermon. John chapter 6. I'm not going to be able to hit all the points that I want to in John 6, but we'll see what we can do with the time we have. John chapter number 6. Look at verse number 31. Because now we're going to go back. This is the New Testament talking about the manna, everything we just read in Exodus and in the other verses that we turn to. It says in verse 31 of John 6, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Right? And that's accurate. Verse 32, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Now, in context, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. And, um, you know, they're saying... Because they had this big thing of, well, we follow Moses, we follow Moses, all this other stuff. And he's saying, well, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as they really given bread from heaven. He's thinking that, like, that, that bread came from Moses. And Jesus said, look, Moses didn't give you that bread from heaven. He says, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So now he's saying, because he's going to say later, that he is the bread of heaven. And it says, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 
This is the other symbolic reference of the manna. The manna was given them. It was, it was angel's food, right? It was the corn of heaven. God sent them this food from heaven for them to eat and for them to stay alive, to give them life in the wilderness <coughs> when they had no other hope, when they had no other food source. God gave them that life. And Jesus is saying, look, I am the bread of life. Jesus came down from heaven to bring life unto the people. Without Jesus, you would die. You would starve. You'd have no sustenance. And that's, this is the other symbolic reference of manna is that it, it's totally prophesying Jesus Christ coming in, in just the fact that God provided with them with their physical salvation with that manna. Well, Jesus provides your soul eternal salvation because he came down from heaven and he's the bread of life. He says, he that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 36, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So the Jews don't like hearing this saying, that, oh, well, you, you're the bread that came down from heaven? And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Now they're wrong here because they think that Joseph is his father and he's not. God is his father. <coughs> All right? They think they know where he came from, but they don't. It says, Jesus answered therefore in verse 43 and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. There's so many great souling verses in this chapter. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. He said, look, they ate that manna, but now they're dead. Okay? Yeah, that manna provide, got them through the wilderness. That manna, you know, was, was fed to them, but they're dead. You know, that bread that they ate was not everlasting. That wasn't eternal. That was something that was just given to them to get them through that time. He says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. You see, he's saying, this is what it was truly pointing about. That manna, look, that was physical, that was food, that's something that they ate, but it's not something that, that kept them alive forever. He says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. You can never die. You eat of the manna, you eat of Jesus Christ, of his flesh and his blood, as he said, You'll never die. You have eternal life. Verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Uh, verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers that eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So that manna is, is and that's what I was saying, it was important early on to see that he called it bread. He called the manna bread because Jesus is referring so many times here in John chapter 6 that I am the bread of life. I am that, you know, um, the bread that will give you everlasting life. And he says you have to eat of this bread. And he's referring to himself. 
See, he goes further. The, the Jews, they, just, they don't understand it. They're not saved. They don't even understand the Word of God. So they're hearing this stuff, and they just it's going completely over their head. They're not getting it. But even though they're not getting it, Jesus just goes real hardcore, and he says, look, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. He's saying, you have to eat the flesh, you have to drink the blood. Now, is he talking about his physical flesh and drinking his physical blood? No, of course he's not. But, I mean, that's one of the false teachings of the Catholic Church today, the transubstantiation of, of his flesh and his blood when they eat the wafer and, and drink the, the, the wine. They think that it turns into Jesus Christ's flesh and his blood because of these statements that he made here. They think that somehow they are literally eating his flesh and his blood. But this entire chapter, he's calling himself the bread of life. So he's saying, look, you have to eat of the bread of life. You have to partake of that. You have to, to, to eat that. You have to consume that in order to be saved, in order to receive eternal life. That has to become a part of you. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, God will give you the Holy Spirit, and that'll become a part of you. Now, the manna in the wilderness, as we mentioned before, that brought physical salvation to the children of Israel. That kept them alive. They had to rely on God to feed them. And, and, to, and to get them through 40 years in the wilderness with just that manna. That bread was given to them from heaven, and it was a picture of what was going to come. Jesus is the bread. He came down from heaven, and he's the giver of eternal life. We need to rely on him to save us, the same way that the children of Israel relied on that manna in the wilderness to save them. And also, just as the manna was used to teach that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, Think about this, Jesus Christ is the Word of God, right? The Bible says in John 1, 1 that He is the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You cannot have life without the Word. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you need God's words to be saved. You need Jesus Christ to be saved. Jesus is the Word. And it's talking about that the manna is referring to the Word as well. Um, just real interesting, all of these different, the, the way that the Bible harmonizes so perfectly. And, um, you know, all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, these truths are eternal. You can't have life without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that manna. He's that bread from heaven. And um, it's real interesting just, just kind of learning about manna and, and how God's able to provide. And don't, don't just think, hey, this is something that happened in the Old Testament either. I mean, this is something that's written for our admonition for us to learn. But God is able to take care of you. God is able to, to provide all of your needs. God is able to, to do these things, um, whatever your needs are in your life. But he wants us to rely on him. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to have the right attitude. He wants us to seek first the kingdom of heaven and, and his righteousness. So then he can add all these things unto us. He'll take care of you. You're his child. He will. He does. <laughs> As any loving father would, he'll take care of you, of your needs, the things that you need. It doesn't mean he's going to give you all the riches, but hey, these riches are going to be burned up. It's going to be nothing. We need to lay up treasures for ourselves that are going to last forever. And we can do it. He's told us how to do it. We can have a mansion and riches forever and ever and ever. I would spend your time working on getting those rewards and getting those riches way more than I'd be worried about the, the, the temporal stuff that's just going to be burned up and just gone. You don't know what's going to happen on the morrow. I mean, you can, be, you can die just like that any given day. And then what is all of your stuff going to do good for anybody? Who cares? It's going to be gone. Let's bow our time word for it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for giving us the manna from heaven. We thank you for Jesus Christ who's come and is able to supply all of our needs. Lord, help us to have the faith required to, to just completely rely on you, dear Lord, and not to trust in ourselves, and not to trust in our own works and our own flesh, dear God, and, and not to be focused on our flesh, dear Lord, but to be focused on the things that matter. Help us to, to be led by you and to, and to wake up every morning and to, and to read your word and to get our hearts right with you that we can start our day off right with the right focus, dear Lord, and that we would not uh, not be too concerned with the things of this world. 
God, we love you. We thank you for saving us and, and providing a free gift of salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.